Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry exam question walkthrough where I'm going to take a look at a question about aluminium extraction through the process of electrolysis. As you probably know, when I go through these questions I'm going to write down my thoughts in blue and the answers that will actually get you the marks in green so you can see how that breaks down on a mark by mark basis. This is quite a long question, it spans over two pages, so I suggest you pause it and have a go at it yourself and then have a look at what I think about each question. So it says here that the question is about electrolysis. Aluminium is produced by electrolyzing a molten mixture of aluminium oxide and cryolite. And the first part of the question says, why do we use a mixture as the elect electrolyte instead of aluminium oxide by itself? Sometimes they'll give you a diagram to help you support your answers, but they haven't done it here, but I've just inserted one to help me with my explanations. And what you can see is happening here is this bit in the middle, this is where the aluminium oxide is placed, and then it's melted down using the cryolite as well. And then we've got the different electrodes. We've got the positive electrode, or three of them, dipping down into the aluminium oxide and connected up here to the electrical circuit. And then we've got the negative cathode lower down. And we've got this thing, the label's just cropped off, but this is where the aluminium actually collects. And so we use a mixture of cryolite because all mixtures generally have a lower melting point than something that is pure. So adding the cryolite lowers the melting point of the aluminium oxide. And then because the melting point has been lowered, less energy is needed for the electrolysis process. And then the next part of the question says, what happens at the negative electrode during the production of aluminium? Now, we know that the negative electrode attracts positive ions because opposite charges attract in an electrostatic attraction. So whatever forms at the negative electrode must have come from the positive ion. And electrolysis generally is where you split apart an ionic compound into its separate elements. So we're making an element. Now we've got the big clues that aluminium is being formed because aluminium ions must be doing something in order to turn into the element. Now the ion aluminium is positive because all metals form positive ions and because aluminium is in group 3 of the periodic table it is actually going to be a 3 plus ion and as I said earlier we're turning at this ion into the element aluminium and all metals have got the simple formula of whatever that metal symbol is so AL here so the aluminium is going from a 3 plus ion into the element aluminium and to do that its charge which was plus three at the beginning because it was a positive ion must have gone down to zero so to do that it must have gained three electrons and so therefore the positive answer that we need to take that's going to get us the marks is that the aluminium is going to gain electrons and it must be this third one down because the first one down is is a decoy aluminium atoms gain electrons well they aren't atoms at the beginning they become atoms once they have gained the electrons and then part C says oxygen is produced at the positive electrode and we need to complete the balanced equ equation for that formation. So oxygen is in group six. So once it forms an ion, it needs to have gained two electrons to make that ion. And once it's gained two electrons, it becomes the negative oxide ion with a negative charge of minus two. And so the ion always goes on the left hand side during electrolysis and our element is on the right hand side. Now we need to take two steps to balance this equation. The first rule of balancing equations is always make sure that you've got the same atoms on both sides of the equation. And you can see here we've got two oxygen atoms on the right hand side and we've only got one oxygen ion on the left hand side so we need to do the first job of putting that two in front of the oxide ion so we've now got two O2 minus and then the second rule of balancing equations that involve ions is we need to make sure that the charge is the same on both sides of the equation so here we've got two minus for the oxide ion 
but because there are two of them, that means that on the left-hand side of the equation, there's a 4 minus charge. And so the right-hand side of the equation needs a 4 minus charge as well. At the moment, it doesn't have any charge because the oxygen molecule is neutral. So we need to put in our negative electrons to the right-hand side. Not just one of them, we need to have four of them because that then gives us a 4 minus charge on both sides of the equation. So this is likely to be one mark for the correct substances, so O2 minus and the electron, and then the second mark for the correct balancing. And then the final question on this page it says, explain why the positive electrode must be continuously replaced. And so the first part to this is to recognize that the positive electrode is made of carbon in the form of graphite. And then, as we know from part C, oxygen is actually being formed at this positive electrode. And what we need to remember here is that carbon can react with oxygen at these high temperatures that there are in the electrolysis cell. And what that makes is carbon dioxide. And so really what we're kind of doing is we're almost burning away this electrode. And this is a three mark question here. So these three bullet points that I've put in are the best three marks to say. Occasionally, this is a four mark question, in which case you need to add in the extra point about the electrode being burned away. But three marks here, so this has covered it. Now, this is the second part of the question, and actually two of these, I should point out, E and G, are actually higher tier only questions because of the maths that's involved in them. And so my recommendation for the first question in E for this reacting mass calculation is to use the grid method. So when you're setting out the grid method, you need to have three columns and five rows. And these are the labels for your rows that I'm showing here on the left hand side. And so the first heading is the chemicals. And that's where you write in which chemicals you're interested in. Now, to decide the chemicals that you're interested in, you need to make sure you read the question carefully. We've been asked for the mass of oxygen produced from 2,000 kilograms of aluminium oxide. So those are our two chemicals in question. And we should just take a quick note that it's 2,000 kg because that will become relevant later, because when we use the grid, we need to be putting grams in. So it's worth stating right now that to turn 2000 kg into grams, we need to multiply that by 1000, and that gets us actually 2 million grams of aluminium oxide. So our two chemicals are aluminium oxide, and I'm just going to write in the formula, and oxygen gas. And then actually I'm going to jump right down to the bottom of this grid and go for the ratio. Now the ratio is just simply the numbers from the equation. So there's a 2 in front of the aluminium oxide and a 3 in front of the oxygen. And we just put those numbers into the grid. And what that means is that if we have 2 moles of aluminium oxide, we will produce 3 moles of oxygen. And in fact, for this question, aluminium is not relevant to us. So I'm just going to put brackets around it just to demonstrate the fact that we really only care about the aluminium and the oxygen. And then we need to put in our last bit of data, which was our mass of aluminium oxide that we've just calculated. And that was 2 million grams. And the good thing about the grid method is it sort of leads you through what the next step is. And because the third row down is MR, we obviously need to work out the MRs of our two substances. That's the relative formula mass. And so to do that, we add together two aluminiums, which is 27 multiplied by 2, and then three oxygens, so three lots of the 16. And that gives us a total of 102 grams per mole for the MR. And then we can do the same thing for our oxygen. That's obviously much easier. 16 and 16 gives us the 32 grams per mole for the oxygen. And so we've done quite a lot of the work now and everything else sort of falls into place because what we can see here is we know the mass and we know the MR for the aluminium oxide. And so we need to work out the moles. 
And as you need to remember, moles is equal to mass divided by mR. So on this occasion, it's 2 million divided by 102. And when you put that number into your calculator, you get a very big number. You get 19,608 moles of aluminium oxide. And so that's the second column completely filled in. And we now need to move over to our third column. And we've got two gaps there. And ultimately, the piece of information that we want is we want to know the mass of oxygen that will be produced. So just before that we do that, we need to work out the moles of oxygen that will be produced. And that's where our ratio comes in, because we can see from the ratio that two moles of aluminium oxide makes three moles of oxygen. So that's a proportion. And what we can probably tell is that three is one and a half times bigger than two. So to turn two into three, we need to multiply it by 1.5. And that's exactly what we need to do for the 19,608 moles. We need to multiply it by 1.5. Or if you prefer, you could say, right, well, I'm going to divide it by two and then I'm going to multiply it by 3 because that is obviously the equivalent of multiplying it by 1.5 because that is 3 over 2. And so when you put that number into your calculator, you get another big number. And for a reasonableness check, you should always kind of think, right, well, it's going to be bigger because 3 is 1.5 times bigger than 2. So this is going to be bigger and it is. It's 29,412 moles of O2 being produced. And then our final step is to use mass equals Mr. Moles, or mass is MR times by moles. And what we get there when we do 29,412 times by 32 is 941,000, at least to three significant figures. It's uh, 176. But three significant figures is going to be absolutely fine for our purposes because our final step is to convert this 941,000 grams into kilograms because that was the command for the final um, step for this question. And so we need to divide that number by 1,000 to turn grams into kilograms and we get 941 kilograms being produced. And then the second question moves us back to the electrolysis principles because we are asked to explain why sodium chloride solution, and I'm going to circle solution, can't be used as the electrolyte to produce sodium metal. And that's a complicated answer because if we didn't have a solution, if we had sodium chloride liquid, so we'd mol melted the sodium chloride down, we would get sodium metal and we would get chlorine gas. But when it's a solution, you also have got water. That's what's made it into the solution. The water has dissolved the sodium chloride to allow those ions to be free to move. And when you pass electricity through water, some of that water splits apart into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And so when you do electrolysis of this solution, there are two different ions that could go to the electrodes. There is sodium, which is positive, and hydrogen, which is positive. And there is chloride, which is negative, and there is hydroxide, which is negative. Those are the four ions that we've got in our electrolysis cell. And so we have to work out which of these ions would go to which electrode. And what we're interested here is explaining about the sodium. So we don't really need to worry too much about the chloride ions, although in case you're wondering it, it would be the chloride ion that would go to the electrode because that's a group seven element. And that's the ion that will always go if it's there. But for the positive ion, the question is, which is more reactive, sodium or hydrogen? And the answer is sodium. And so the one that's more reactive stays in solution, and the one that's less reactive goes to the electrode to gain those electrons. And so the answer that we need to put in here is that it's the hydrogen that is less reactive than sodium, and so hydrogen would be produced at the electrode instead of sodium. And the sodium would stay behind along with the hydroxide and we'd end up making sodium hydroxide as our third product. So chlorine at the positive electrode, 
hydrogen at the negative electrode and the sodium hydroxide would be left behind. And then the final part of this question is back to a bit of maths, and we've been asked to calculate the volume that 150 kilograms of chlorine gas would have at room temperature and pressure. Now that sounds like a really complicated question, but they've told us in the second part that the volume of one mole would be 24 decimeters cubed at room temperature and pressure. And so since we know that one mole would be 24 decimeters cubed, our job really is to work out how many moles we've got of chlorine in that 152 kilograms. And so stage one is to do that as a calculation. So 150 kilograms is 150,000 grams. So we have to times that by a thousand again. We have to divide it by the MR because moles is mass over MR. And we've been given the MR as part of the question, 71. So it's 150,000 divided by 71, which is 2,113 moles of chlorine. And since one mole of chlorine is 24 decimeters cubed, 2,113 moles of chlorine will be a lot bigger. It will be 2,113 times bigger. We are literally multiplying that number of moles by 24 because that's the volume that this would occupy. And so our final answer is going to be 50,700 decimeters cubed. So a very big number indeed. And just for a reasonableness check, we would expect the final answer to be more than a thousand times bigger than our 24 decimeters cubed because we've got 2000 moles and one mole is 24 decimeters cubed. And so we can say 50,000 or 51,000 because two significant figures is likely to be fine here because we've got 71 and 150 and that's the two significant figures. Okay, that's the end of this question. I hope that was useful. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.